Church. It's a great day to be in God's house. It's great to be joining God's people worldwide in song, in prayer, in listening to God's word both read and preached. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We begin our worship this morning by standing and singing number 307, All Creatures of Our God and King. morning. It is my joy to welcome you to the worship of God at Second Ponce de Leon Baptist Church. I'm glad you're here on this beautiful morning. It is beautiful in this room to see you as we worship God together. If you are a guest with us today, we are so glad that you are here. We would invite you to take one of the cards in the pew rack in front of you. That's a, a guest card. Fill that out, drop it in the offering plate. That way we can share a little information about our church with you. We would also invite you at the end of worship to 
come just straight out those doors in the back. There's a welcome table, and we have some information we would love to share with you and a gift to give to you. And for those of you who are worshiping with us by television or online, from wherever you are sitting today, we're glad that you join your heart with ours as we worship together in this place. This is a special Sunday for our church. We call this morning in our time of worship our Pledge Sunday. Many of you have already turned in commitment cards of stewardship commitments for the new year, but today is a day we're encouraging everyone to do that. There are pledge cards in the pew rack in front of you, or you can also give online or pledge online. Following worship today, we have lunch. We move from here to our fellowship hall where lunch is served, and then our annual church in conference, an important meeting to adopt a budget, elect leaders for the new year. Four o'clock today, we worship together again in our all-together service. And then we have invited the whole community to come and be with us this afternoon, starting at five o'clock for Trunk or Treat. Thank you for many of you who are providing trunks and candy and costumes and fun as we welcome our community together in this place. It's a big day, and I'm glad that you are here with us. And so as our day begins, we've offered our songs to God. Let's now offer our prayers to God as we pray together. For the gift of this day, O oh God, we give thanks. For we know this day comes from your grace, and we are grateful for it. We thank you for the way you have filled this day with beauty. And we thank you that you have given it to us. For the gift of this church, O oh God, and the opportunity to worship together in this place, our hearts are filled with expectation. So help us to listen to your voice speaking to us. And then we pray that you will listen to us as we offer the prayers of our hearts and the praises of our lips to magnify your name. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ that we do pray. Amen. As we continue in worship together this morning, hear now these words from Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good as long as you live, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works vindication and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. For he knows how we were made. He remembers that we are dust. For as for mortals, their days are like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, 
to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, obedient to his spoken word. Bless the Lord, all his host, his ministers that do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, and in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. In your vibrant bulletins, you will see in bold print our corporate confession of sin. And if by chance you'd locate that for me, I would just be happy. <laughs> and so friends, let's read our corporate confession of sin together. Almighty God, we confess how hard it is to be your people. You have called us to be the church, to continue the mission of Jesus Christ to our lonely and confused world. Yet we acknowledge we are more apathetic than active, isolated than involved, callous than compassionate, obstinate than obedient, legalistic than loving. Gracious Lord, have mercy upon us and forgive our sins. Remove the obstacles preventing us from being your representatives to a broken world Awaken our hearts to the promised gift of your indwelling spirit. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, even in the midst of our sins, we are thankful for Jesus Christ, that we have the assurance of pardon. This is the message we have heard from God and proclaim to you, that God is light and in God there is no darkness at all. If we walk in the light, as God is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Amen and amen.
Well, I don't know about you, but I feel like heaven appreciates that selection. And so my friends, with that little taste of heaven, let's pray together. Loving God, who loves us in spite of us, providing God, who provides in the midst of us, comforting God, who travels along with us, we thank you this day for you simply being God. We thank you for this church and the foundation of which it is built upon. We thank you, God, for breath in our bodies, blood in our veins, and the life that we are experiencing even now. We confess, God, that sometimes we treat you as common. We confess, God, that oftentimes we put our comfort over worshiping and glorifying Christ, but yet we're thankful. Thankful that even in spite of us, you continue to love us. Thankful that even in the midst of grief, you are still found to be good. And so God, for the healing that all of us are in desperate need of, heal us, God. For the world that we find ourselves matriculating in and through, walk with us, God. Heal our nation, God. Be with our leaders, God. Love us, God, in spite of us. Gracious God, we come at this moment, God, weak and feeble from the different challenges that many of us face. But we know that you are a God of all people, a God who provides justice and a God who is true. May we find rest in that fact. May we observe your glory in nature. May we observe your goodness in people. And today, God, may we glorify you by worshiping you in spirit and in truth. We thank you for Second Ponce. We thank you for later the candy that we will eat together and the business that we will handle together. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for life. These and other many blessings we ask in your son, Jesus Christ's name, we do pray. And all that agree said, amen. We continue our worship with hymn 460, 460. We'll be singing a different tune this morning. You'll recognize the tune when you hear it play. Number 460, hear, O oh my Lord, I see you face to face.
I've been waiting a whole year to say this. Good morning, church. They only let me up here once a year, so I'm glad that I'm here today to to be able to say that. Um, It is uh, Pledge Card Sunday, Stewardship Sunday, uh, Commitment Sunday, uh, Witness Protection Sunday, any other? any other Sundays that we've got. Uh, it, today is the day. It's arrived. We're here. We've had a great month of, uh, of sermons on witnessing, being a better witness. Uh, we've had some great guest speakers who have come in and talked to us about how our faithfulness has allowed them to witness to the world and to the community. And we should all uh, just, I, I'm, I was moved by every single one of those. We've had some fabulous stewardship testimonies uh, this month as well. And uh, I was going to get up and give a stewardship testimony, but I'm afraid mine's a little milk toast compared to the ones we've heard already. So uh, I'm not going to do that, but I am going to do one thing. I'm going to make a confession before everyone. This is my pledge card. This morning, as Ivy and I were getting ready for church, she said, she asked me, how much did you sign up on the pledge card? And I said, nothing. And I looked at her and said, how much did you sign up on the pledge card? And she said, nothing. So each of us thinking the other had done what we should have already done, we didn't do it. <laughs> so, but we did it. So wherever Jeff Miller, it, it's here. So, <laughs> uh, and if, if you haven't turned in your pledge card, please do so. This is the Sunday to do it. Uh, a lot of folks are doing it online. I've had several folks who have sent me emails and called me and said, how do we do this online? And I've walked them through it. And so we've been able to do that. But, as I said, my testimony is a little milk toast because um, 40 years ago, last Sunday, Ivy and I got married. And we received our, happy anniversary, where are you? <laughs> we received our, our combined pledge card uh, in the mail and we filled it out and we turned it in and we've been doing it ever since. So not a whole lot there. But I do want to talk about something today, something that, that really moved me. You know, one of the great things about singing in the choir is you get to see what goes on in the congregation. And I want to talk about I want to, something that I witnessed that first Sunday when, after Robin Mathis uh, gave her testimony and, uh, and they were passing the plate. There was a little girl sitting over here on the left. And I don't know if she missed the plate or if she wasn't ready to give when the plate came by, but she got up at the very end when the plates were already at the back. She got up and walked all the way down the aisle, walked over to the plate and dropped her offering in, and she came back. She was committed to do so. And that was just a powerful witness to me. I thought that was something. I don't know if anybody else saw that or not, but uh, it, it, was, uh, it was something special to me. Um, several weeks ago, Bill Dukes came up and led us in an offertory prayer. And he talked about those, uh, those uh, members years ago who planted the seeds to which we're the, uh, we, we, we are the stewards of today. And then several weeks ago, Bill Gabbard led the choir in an in a anthem entitled, Find Us Faithful. And the premise of the song was, may all who come behind us find us faithful. Well, if this little girl is any, any example of what we should expect for those who come behind us, I think we're going to be okay. So let's uh, join me in prayer, please. Most gracious Father, thank you for those that came before us. Thank you that we're here, that we can be faithful to you, and may we continue to be faithful to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
in Acts. I'm reading from chapter 2, verses 36 through 42. Therefore let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized. And that day about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Well, those of you who are just completely wed to the Christian calendar were alarmed. The scripture I just read from Acts chapter 2 is the story of Pentecost. And you know that the Christian calendar has Pentecost in late May. I'm not just working out of order. We will do it again in late May. (laughs) We will, I promise. But. You know that this month, in our stewardship emphasis, we've been working backwards through the book of Acts, and this our last Sunday on the founding of the church. It's kind of like the Star Wars storyline, right? It started and you just keep moving backwards through the story. We started with the spread of the gospel to the known world. We have worked back all the way now to where we're at the birth of the church and the first forming values of the believing community, the basics. In my first sermon ever as your pastor, I preached from this pulpit on the basics. I'm sure you remember. My text was 1 John. And I told the story about Tommy Lasorda, the longtime manager of the L.A. Dodgers, who said to have begun each spring training by holding up a baseball and saying, gentlemen, this is a baseball. Players who'd made it to the major leagues were probably ahead of him on that. But it was his way of saying, it is spring training. We're going to start all over with the basics. We're going to hit and run and catch and throw, and every great franchise starts over reminds themselves again of the fundamentals at the beginning of every spring. Gentlemen, this is a baseball. Well, however much cultural anxiety about the future of the church in America, we are not going to resort to staff mud wrestling or whatever gimmick we think might draw a crowd. We're the church. We're going to start each spring with the same spring training kinds of mantra, a return to the fundamentals. And in that spirit, we're returning to Acts chapter 2. What is at the core of the church's founding? What are the fundamental values that should be baked into our identity as the people of God? Well, let's take a look at the story. Luke is the writer, you know. Luke's the writer of Acts, and he's a participant in the story. So so sometimes he kind of toggles back and forth between saying they and we because he was there. But even though he wrote it, he's not the hero. Peter and Paul are the primary faces in Acts, but they're not the heroes either. The heroes in Acts are the Holy Spirit, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the church set loose. 3,000 people come to faith in Jesus, but it's not the power of Peter's preaching. It's not the determination of the crowd to get right with God. Luke makes it clear that the church is formed by the powerful wind 
of God's Spirit. And Peter is preaching that day to a gathered group of Jews, and he's linking their story to the Jesus story. Let the entire house of Israel know, he says. And he declares that the crucified Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah of Israel. And when the crowd hears it, when the crowd hears this message, they're cut to the heart. They turn to Peter and the apostles and they ask, brothers, what are we to do? Peter says, repent, be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins might be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it happened that day and 3,000 people repented and were baptized and the church was born. So what did they do? What was the first strategic plan? What was the first mission of the church? Did they send missionaries right off the bat? No. Did they get on with evangelizing the known world? No. Because mission and evangelism of the church is an outgrowth of the formation that happens first in community. And here's what they did first. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of the bread and the prayers. Gentlemen, this is a baseball. It starts there. The fundamentals are honed first when the church does church right. Mission follows getting church right. And the first thing they did was they devoted themselves. The first hallmark of the early church, the believing community, was devotion. They didn't consider or drop in, get their name on the roll. They were devoted, fully in. There's a story told by, uh, by the German Jewish poet Heinrich Hein. He, he's standing in front of the great cathedral uh, of, of Amiens in France. The friend asks, why can't people build piles like this anymore? Hein said, my dear friend, in those days people had convictions. We moderns have opinions. And it takes more than opinions to build a Gothic cathedral. It's worth pondering. The first fundamental of the early church was their devotion. Perhaps their devotion will shine a light on ours. And here's what they were devoted to. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They wanted to know all they could about the Christ. As often as they could, every time the doors were open at the church, they were showing up to hear the stories and the interpretations of Jesus' teaching. They couldn't get enough because their lives were being shaped by the life-giving words of Jesus, and they gave themselves to it, devoted. And they devoted themselves to fellowship, the Scripture says. They didn't get all their teaching online. They got together. They gathered with each other. They told their stories in addition to the gospel story and found the places where they intersected. They kept each other's kids, had each other over for dinner. They failed each other and forgave each other. Sometimes they just hung out. They made friends. They came through for one another. They formed community around their shared commitment to Christ. I like what Samuel Wells says about the importance of this part of their life together, fellowship. He says, church means giving up the fantasy that we can find fulfillment and righteousness alone. It means doing things at inconvenient times with eccentric people in sometimes clumsy ways because life is a team game. 
And on Judgment Day, God will have nothing to say to us if we think we can come without the others. They voted themselves to teaching. They devoted themselves to fellowship and the breaking of bread. That's the way our Scripture version has it, the breaking of bread. But it's missing the word the. In, it, in the Greek, it's the breaking of the bread, not just any bread. This isn't Wednesday night church. This isn't Saturday mornings at the Waffle House. This is the bread, the bread of holy communion that's at the center of worship. They devoted themselves to coming together like we have today to worship to come to the Lord's table, to break and share the bread of life and lift themselves up subject to the will of God. And finally the scripture says, they devoted themselves to teaching, to fellowship, to breaking of bread, and to the prayers. They devoted themselves to the nurture of their own inner life, to the prayers, to the communion with the risen Christ through the gift of prayer. And notice that all of these disciplines come before the church ever went out and healed a lame man, like last week at the beautiful gate, before the church started taking care of the needs in the community like the week before. The first priority of the church was to get together to learn, to fellowship, to worship, to pray. The fundamentals of church life together and the disciplines that empower and animate the ministry in the world. Gentlemen, this is a baseball. We start here, and the mission goes from there. Now, a church that's turned in on itself, you know, isn't a church at all. It's a club. And and the book of Acts clearly outlines this for us. The mission and ministry of the church does push beyond the walls of this place, and it should push into a broken and hurting world. And over these last weeks of October, we've been celebrating your commitment to the mission that is impacting our community and the world over. But do not underestimate the value of our financial commitment within these walls and within the lives of people in this congregation. What we do in this place matters at a most fundamental level. Our mission and ministry are an outgrowth of our disciplines and devotions that are taught and nurtured in this place. When you pledge and give, you're not only supporting the outreach and the ministry, the mission and the witness that we've been celebrating over the last few weeks, but without apology, you are also ensuring that we continue to focus on forming one another around the core values represented at the birth of the church. So let me celebrate how you are doing some of that already. You are also doing the teaching ministry of the church by what you give. You're giving by Sunday school literature, supports vacation Bible school, Wednesday night speedle you, age group Bible studies, and felt boards in the children's building with little donkeys and wise men. You should go over if you haven't already. You're supporting all of that. Your giving supports a high-level course taught by a Mercer professor on an introduction to the Old Testament. And you buy Play-Doh so that children can sit in little wooden chairs and roll out a sword of truth and squish together a little helmet of salvation. And you bought it. And your giving pays Miss Heather to teach children to sing Jesus Loves Me, This I Know. And it gets embedded in their heart forever. And when they are old and in the home, 
their mouth will still move and sing along to Jesus loves me. We're able to continue this central teaching ministry of the church because of your devotion. That's what we mean by witness protection. We protect the witness when we share in the joy of passing it down and teaching. Let me say a word about fellowship among you. Once a month, the women of our church get together socially just to chat about work and kids and life and stuff. Every few months, the lawyers of our church get together and complain about 12-hour work days and celebrate what they do that makes a difference. And they've even come together to help on specific cases around the church. Every Tuesday night, the young adults of this church meet together. I don't know how many of y'all know about this. It's a great group, a vibrant group. They meet together every Tuesday to sit and talk about living the Christian life in Atlanta with all the pressures. How do we support each other? How do we pray for each other? How do we help each other along the Christian walk? In just a few hours, we're going to be gathered out in the parking lot with our costumes on, handing out candy, just enjoying each other. Heather has picked out my costume again this year. It's a dangerous thing for me to turn loose. Turns out I will be Minion Dave from the movie Despicable Me. Be here at five to see it. It's what fellowship is. We hang out. You go to each other's Friday night football games. You meet for play dates. You have each other to cook, over to cook chicken on the grill. Your lives become knit together in ways that build authentic community. And then when life disappoints or crumbles, you have friends, not just acquaintances. You have friends who show up. And community formation happens because part of what you put in the offering plate supplements it. Supplements our $5 lunch after worship today, buys lemonade for us to share every now and then on the lawn after church, lets Josh buy pizza when he hangs out with teenagers after a football game. And worship. Every Sunday we gather in this beautiful and sacred space to open our eyes and our hearts and our voices to the Holy One. And even this summer when it was 95 degrees, because you pledged and gave to the budget, it was cool in here. And today we enjoy electric lights and sound. When needed, this sanctuary gets a coat of paint. All of that doesn't just happen. It happens because you are generous. You pay musicians to bring their amazing gifts to lead us high into the presence of God. And you pay me for the remarkable privilege to sit with my door closed and a candle lit to read and pray and think and try to put words together that help us speak our shared faith. You buy bread and juice, and we stand here and lift them high. And they become transformed into the symbols of body and blood and redemption. And all of this happens because you support the budget. We don't sell anything in here. You give because God's love has transformed you, and you want to participate in funding ways that the worship of God will continue to happen in this space long after we are here, when the little girl who rushed down to put her money in the offering plate is in a position of leadership. We're trying to provide witness protection now. And prayers... Soon the women of our church will be at a retreat at Camp Pinnacle working on the inner life, trying to grow their life of prayer. We walked the halls not too many Sundays ago 
after worship and went to prayer stations set up so that we could pray for the ministries of this church. On Wednesday night, our study of Philippians has included a prayer practice each week, just some light lifting to make sure that the muscles of the inner life don't go flabby. Each Sunday, one of our ministers voices a corporate prayer, but we also resource and teach and retreat and give tools that every person can deepen his or her inner life to grow the life of prayer. And these retreats, these resources, yeah, you're ahead of me, I know. We support the fundamentals, the basics of what it means to be church because we give. Remember in the reading from Acts that the first marker for Christian community was their devotion. They were devoted to the fundamentals of the faith and devoted to the support that is needed to ensure the ministry and the growth of the church. And in a few minutes we're going to go upstairs and vote on a budget for next year. The allocation of those funds that makes the work possible. But the allocation is only possible if we all reclaim our devotion like they had in the early church. Our shared commitment to giving to the church so that that allocation can live. When we are formed by these core essential disciplines in this place, when we give to teach each other how to, how to worship and pray and, and form community and all of those things. That is when we become equipped to be the salt and light in this world that the hurting world so desperately needs. Go into deeper devotion and appreciation and go in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Just over my shoulder is the roar of Peachtree Road where it intersects with East Wesley and Buckhead. And a little nearer to me, but also over my shoulder, is the entrance to Second Ponce de Leon Baptist Church, where our members and guests enter to escape the Atlanta chaos. Each Sunday, they leave the demands and noise of Atlanta life to enter the sanctuary of community and worship. A sanctuary is defined as a place of refuge or safety and we need this place of renewal. This is our place of refuge, our place to pull away from the chaos and to worship and to renew and inspire each other to be the best, most loving version of ourselves. We're always happy to have you worship with us online or on television, but I want to commend our sanctuary. I hope you will pull in sometime out of the busyness of Peachtree Road and enjoy what we experience each week. <laughs>